Psalm 81, verses 1 through 5. Sing praises to God, our strength. Sing to the God of Jacob. Sing, beat the tambourines, play the sweet lyre and the harp. Blow the ram's horn at the new moon, and again at full moon to call a festival. For this is required by the decrees of Israel. It is a regulation of the God of Jacob. He made it a law for Israel when he attacked Egypt to set us free. I heard an unknown voice say, now I will take the load from your shoulders. I will free your hands from their heavy task. Amen. Thanks be to God. We're going to continue talking about walls and barriers and barricades this morning. Our focus, walls themselves, are neither good nor bad. Sometimes they create peace and security. Sometimes they create suffering and anger. But when we learn to trust God for our security and peace, we no longer need walls to protect ourselves. This morning is from the letter to the Philippians. Good morning. I'm Patty Boone, and this morning I'll be reading from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, talking about the attitude of Christ and the attitude of humility. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others, too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord in the glory of God the Father. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the open, opening prayer. Holy God, teach us to see with your eyes, to hear with your ears, to reach out with your hands, and to love with your heart. Amen. And our second reading is quite a few verses actually from the book of Acts. 
Good morning. I'm Linda Stevenson, and this morning I will be reading excerpts from Acts chapter 10. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming towards him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. The angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. The next day, as Cornelius messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on a flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry, but while a, man, a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet came down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish law has deemed impure and unclean. The voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then, the men sent by Cornelius, Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Peter replied, I see very clearly what God shows, no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace when God's through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened through, throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit came upon all who listened to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out to the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit, just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that you will help us today to hear, to understand, and to respond to your word for us on in this moment. Amen. In many ways, the story of Peter being sent to Cornelius is very similar 
uh, to the story that we heard last week about Philip being sent to the Ethiopian eunuch. There's some of the same themes that are rehearsed again. The story um, from the book of Acts from chapter 10 that we heard this morning is abbreviated. Some verses are left out, not because they're any less significant, but just to make the story move along a little bit more quickly. But I would encourage you to just read the whole chapter of Acts um, once this video is over or at some other time during the week. Um, and also remind everyone, please keep up with reading the book of Acts. We're into chapter 10 and we'll be moving forward quickly over the next few weeks. So this is a similar story, but it is different in specific details and gives us a bit of another perspective to think about similar themes. The Gentile in this particular story, the outsider in this story is Roman and he is a captain in the Roman guard. Those are the things that we know about him from the outside. Uh, those are the descriptions that anyone could give to him if they met him, if they knew who he was. So a Roman in this context, in this time and place in Jerusalem, anyone who was a Roman was a member of an occupying force. And anyone who was a Roman was pretty much free to do whatever they wanted to do, to take whatever they wanted to take, to extort whatever they could, and to do it without any regulation. A Roman citizen could do what they wanted to do, when they wanted to do it, to whom they wanted to do it, and they did. They took advantage of that position. The scribes and the Pharisees were the um, high status people in the Jewish faith in Jerusalem, but the Romans were the ones who had the real physical power. So they were the occupiers and they were Gentiles. And this particular gentleman, Cornelius, was a captain of the Roman guard. He was a person of authority in the power structure that occupied the city of Jerusalem. He was a person who made decisions. He was a person who gave orders and expected them to be obeyed. And if there were, they weren't, there were consequences for anyone who chose to go against him. This is what we know about him by knowing that he is a captain in the Roman guard. What else do we know about him? It tells us that he was um, someone who was devout and a God-fearer. Now that has a specific meaning. It means that he was a person who had studied the Jewish scriptures. That's what it means to say that he was devout. A God-fearer was someone who respected God, who believed in the God who was revealed in the scripture, but could not be a Jew because he was a Gentile. There was no way to cross from being a Gentile to being a Jew. The closest that a person could get was to be a God-fearer. We know that he was generous. He gave generously to the poor, and we know that he was a man of prayer. So the outside picture of this man, the assumptions that people might make about him knowing his citizenship and knowing his status are really quite different from the inside picture of the man, the man whom God knew. And we know that this was significant to God, the inside of the man, because the angels tell Cornelius directly, God has noticed, God has received your offerings, and God has this response for you. 
God noticed that he was a man, no matter what label he uh, was given, who loved God and loved neighbor. And that was significant where the label didn't matter. Now for Peter, this was a significant hurdle which was going to have to be cleared before he could begin a relationship with this man. The specific issue was the dietary laws, which had been a part of his life for his entire life. He had observed the dietary laws. He understood that they were one way of sharing his love and his respect and his devotion to God. And they defined who he was. He was a Jew. He was set apart. He was uniquely called in this time and in this place. And all of that was defined for the outside and for Peter himself by the dietary laws which he followed. But those dietary laws separated him from the Gentiles. He was not allowed to invite Gentiles into his home. He was not allowed to go into the homes of Gentiles. He was not allowed to break bread with Gentiles. So the angels and the Holy Spirit get involved once again to bridge this gap, to help to dismantle this wall. How do Cornelius and Peter respond then to their different, um, their different messages from God? Cornelius gets a message from the angels uh, and, and, and when the angel appears, just like every place else in scripture, his first response is to be terrified. And then the angel says, don't be afraid. God has noticed. God has received your offerings. And God gives you this direction. And Cornelius is immediately obedient. He doesn't ask questions. He simply sends a couple of his soldiers to go and to do what it is that the angels had instructed him, to go to Joppa and to find this man named Peter. What does Peter do? Peter hears, or hears a voice and sees a vision and is invited to eat. Interestingly, his first response is, no, Lord. Think about that for just a minute. Do you really want to say to the Lord, no, Lord, I can't do that. Now, we understand where it came from. He had no other way to understand this invitation except as a temptation to do something that was prohibited. And so he threw up his hands and said, no, no, Lord. And the vision came again, and the vision came again. And after some persuasion, Peter began to understand what was going on here, to understand that he was invited to share more fully in the creation of that in God's creation and in the lives of the Gentiles eventually. So when he receives specific direction uh, not to worry about the dietary laws, but to go with the men who were coming from Caesarea, he'd been prepared and he was ready to go. So Peter too was obedient. Now when he gets to the home of Cornelius, he remarks, I'm not supposed to do this, but I understand that God is calling me in this situation to enter your home and to speak with you. And then Peter tells the gospel story he says, um, oh goodness, where does it start? This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. 
He goes on to talk about the healing and the other ministries that Jesus engaged in in his lifetime and ends with they put him to death by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him to life on the third day. One more time in capsule form. Peter is obedient. Peter shares the gospel. And then when it becomes apparent to him again that the Holy Spirit has come in power into this household and already blessed this man Cornelius, he reaches out and offers the sign of baptism. He reaches out and embraces Cornelius with the grace of God. We've seen this pattern three times now. Obedience, willingness to tell the gospel story, and the embrace of God's love through the gift of grace. It is completely consistent with the commandment to love God and love neighbor. It is completely aligned with the teaching that all of the law is fulfilled in the choice to love. It is orchestrated and it is sustained directly and immediately by the, whole, the Holy Spirit. Three times now we have seen this pattern repeated. We can take encouragement here. The early church was experiencing a moment of wrenching change. We shouldn't underestimate the, um, the significance of the changes that they were facing and of the mm, new things that they were called to do different from the way that they had always done them before. It truly was a time of wrenching change. And when we find ourselves in a time when so much is changing around us, so much that we don't want to change, so much that we don't want to control, we can take encouragement in these stories because it is out of this time that the new church bloomed and mushroomed all over um, the Mediterranean world. And we can understand that the transformation that happens in the lives of those who are surrendered to the Holy Spirit is not a tweaking of details, is not some cosmetic changes around the edges. It is re-pouring the foundation of who we are. And the two certainties that we're left with are the gospel message, God loved us, sent Christ to restore and redeem us, through Christ defeated the power of sin and death, and Christ lives and reigns. And the second certainty is the power of love reaching out in grace to change the world. In the same way that a child tags back to their adult when they're out in the world. Just want to make sure that mom's still watching. Just want to make sure that dad is still there. Just want to make sure that grandma knows what's going on. They'll be out and exploring and learning and doing and just come back for a moment to touch you on the knee and then go on out there again and, and get busy about their lives again. In the same way that children tag back to their adults, this truth will not fail us. That Jesus lived and died and was raised again for our salvation and that the power of love reaching out in grace cannot be defeated. 
That doesn't make it easy. We can anticipate controversy. In fact, when Peter returns home after having baptized these Gentiles, that's exactly what he faces, controversy, questions. Why did you do it? They weren't even Jews. What made you think that that would be okay? We can expect conflict, as we've seen in previous stories. We can expect even sometimes active persecution. These truths are not a promise that everything will be easy. They make our way clear. We know in every situation and in every moment, the gospel of love and grace and the power of God in the world. When we don't know what to do, we can still know what our next step is. Love God, love your neighbor, and the way will be opened for you. Our reading from Philippians this morning is an expression in the form of a hymn um, of the experience of the early church as they have been doing just that, stepping out, sharing the gospel, loving the people whom they encountered, and seeing the church blossom and bloom. This excerpt from Philippians is actually, most people agree, the very earliest writing that we have in the New Testament. It's not the first thing in order, uh, that would be the Gospel of Matthew, but in terms of when it was written down, many people, really most people believe, this is the first little snippet, the first little scrap that we have of writing from the early church. And it is a hymn, it doesn't sound like it in English, but it is a hymn, and it encapsulates, it captures and pulls together the, um, the stories that we've been hearing and the teaching that we've been hearing. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. God of love and God of power, we thank you for the enduring witness of the early church. We thank you for the stories that we still remember and share. We thank you for lifting our burden and helping us with our task. We thank you for providing clear guidance on the way forward. And especially in this time when so much is uncertain, we pray that you will pour your transforming love into our hearts and minds and spirits. Allow your gospel to live fully in us. Allow it 
to reshape us, to reestablish our foundations in love for God and in love for others so that the confidence and the strength and the joy of the faith can grow up in us and we in turn can share that with those around us who are in such need, who want to know the way to go, who want to feel that they are whole, who want to be accepted and blessed and embraced by your love. Lord, we lift our prayers this morning as well for those whom we love already in this world, those whom we know who are struggling um, in any way. We pray for your healing presence in their lives. We pray for your grace that is stronger than anything which might defeat us. We pray that you will let them know that you are with them and that you are holding them and that you are guiding them forward into your love. We ask the same for our country, that you will pour your gospel into everything that we do, that you will pour your gospel in the way, into the ways that we treat each other, that you will call us all to the highest standards of love for God and the love for each other. We pray that the words that we share will be the standard to which we are pulled up, that we will be a nation where there is justice for all. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and we offer them in the words which he taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. As you consider your offering this morning, you may make a financial contribution at our website, www.mountolivetseaford.org, or you may send a contribution to 315 High Street in Seaford, Delaware. Um, one thing that we're not able to do online, or I mean, uh, well, yes, online, the way that we can do it when we're gathered in person is to share prayer requests if you have a prayer request, if you have a praise, if you have a need, if you have a question, anything that you would like to know that someone else is lifting up in prayer along with you, please send a message to Mount Olivet United Methodist Church. Um, you may put it in a comment if you'd like to, but understand that everyone will see that. If you have something that you'd like to keep a little bit more confidential, send a message and that'll be seen by a group of three or four people who will pray and who will respond to you. So keep that in mind as if there's a need, if there's a thought, question, praise that's, that's a part of your your thoughts this morning, something you'd like to share, that's a couple of ways to do that. I'd also encourage you to consider um, just hitting like uh, on the Facebook page or on YouTube, wherever you're watching that, because that way we have a little bit more sense of 
um, who's out there and, and, and who it is that we're interacting with. And that's very, very helpful. Um, and you can always choose to share this message in your own Facebook account. It's a very, very uh, painless way to invite someone to church, to invite someone to the gospel, to let someone else hear the gospel message and experience the love of God. So please keep all those things in mind as you're considering your response this morning. As that song was played, you may have heard Onward Christian Soldiers. You may have heard Forward Through the Ages. Um, there, there are a couple of different versions, of, or there are a couple of different songs to that same tune, and they both talk about our call to continue to move the gospel of Christ forward and out into the world. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. Amen. Amen.